patient safety problem is huge. It exists everywhere. A study in the United States suggests that medical errors kill more people each year than do road traffic accidents, workplace accidents, and AIDS. Delivering patient safety is a multimedia resource designed for healthcare professionals and leaders who have the responsibility of removing the causes of error in the healthcare system. We did a study on hospital charts from the year 2000 from five different provinces, roughly 3,700 charts, and we found that one in 13 patients uh, experienced an adverse event. 7.5% uh, of hospital patients in Canada. Healthcare can be 10 times, 100 times safer than it is today. We don't, we don't have to be killing and harming patients the way we are. Safety is a particularly unique area of emphasis and focus that we must have. We must be passionate and clearly paying attention to it. Delivering patient safety presents the experience of Canadian and international experts and individuals with frontline responsibilities. The series also draws on a world of proven principles and working experience in other professions who must manage major hazards as part of daily life. There are broadcast standard DVD programs with an accompanying CD of support materials. There's a user's guide, a manual of safety management materials, a set of international case histories, and presentation templates. The package is designed for use throughout the system from board meetings among specialist teams, in staff training sessions, in system-wide management briefings, and in other ways matched to local priorities. The first program is called Facing the Facts. Safety is something that has to be managed, that has to be planned for, that has to be trained for, just like any other medical activity. I remember repeating aloud to my colleagues in the room, injected vincristine into the CSF of a child and everything stopped. For so long we have accepted levels of harm that are so far exceed what any other industry has accepted as normal. We need to decide to be safe. Uh, we need to understand that the defect rates we have today are neither acceptable nor inevitable. What is it that doctors and nurses and clinical teams can start doing tomorrow to improve the situation. I'm going to tell you something that I suspect no one else on the staff of this medical school has ever told you. Perhaps the most important thing that you are ever going to learn here. The second program, Changing the Culture, explores the kinds of change essential to improved outcomes. The program shows how teams and organizations can perform a simple cultural health check. A safe culture is an informed culture. It knows where the edge lies between dangers and safety. It also respects and knows its hazards. None of us uh, are perfect. None of us have all the knowledge in the world. Uh, uh, we're all going to have adverse outcomes. When they occur, I think we need to be confident enough and secure enough to come clean, to discuss that with patients and their families and our colleagues and that culture will then mean a tremendous improvement. It's very difficult to say this went wrong, something happened inappropriately, you know, we could have done better. We're talking about uh, going from uh, paternalism with patients, let the doctor tell you what's right for you, to uh, uh, an openness and a, and a patient partnering where the patient is not only, not only has a right to know, but we want them to know. As a patient, I'd want to know what happened to me. I think I have a right to know. It's absolutely critical that we're honest with our patients. We've got to put the trust back into the public trust and the care back into health care. Why Things Go Wrong is a program which explains what's really happening when an adverse event occurs. We can't eliminate human error, it's part of the human condition, but we can manage it. But if we are to manage it effectively, then we have to understand something about error, something about the varieties of forms that it can take. The objective isn't to make perfect people, it's to keep those mistakes from hurting people. Building Resistance to Error is a program which explains the principles of developing this error resistance on the front line. The crucial part of error management is to identify the error tracks, 
by collecting data about near misses, free lessons, and identifying the workplace circumstances that seems to lure people into error. Removing those error traps is really the first stage of error management. SARS had a big impact on hospitals in Ontario. We saw our colleagues getting sick and dying of a disease that we knew nothing about. People didn't know how to protect themselves well, and part of that was they didn't understand how their contaminated hands were putting their own health at risk. It's really that knowledge and that stark realization that people were dying because their hands were dirty uh, that's led to this campaign and the passion that we see here. A safer system provides practical options for integrating measures aimed at the individual, the team and operating units into a system-wide approach. We need to commit to invest in safety, investing time and energy, technology. It, 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 you don't get it for free, not at the start, and we have, to, we have to allocate resources to make our patients safe. I think one of the real, real issues we have is to figure out a way to engage board members, um, many of whom have no clinical background, clinical experience, but need to understand those kinds of issues just as they understand the financial issues. Leading and learning demonstrates examples of innovation in education. Call it code blue! It is now possible to duplicate all of the events that occur in emergency rooms, on the labor floor, in the intensive care units, uh, on the wards. Uh, all of those uh, adverse events can now be technically uh, duplicated. I think probably one of the most telling examples of the benefit is that we had done some drills uh, a couple summers ago and then one of the nurses came up to me afterwards and said, you know what, that drill we did last week, it went well, but two days later when I was up working, we had another emergency and it went so smoothly it felt like we were doing a drill. Over the next 10 to 20 years, I think we will make important advances in education that will take care of a lot of the problems that right now are so frustrating to change, like improving the culture, for instance. I think our educating our health profession students differently is absolutely essential to improvement because what we want when they're in practice is them to work as teams, to work collectively, to work collaboratively and what they will tell us is that they need to learn how to do that. We've got to understand that we're going to do it together or it's not going to happen. Cooperation, teamwork, coming together across disciplinary boundaries, uh, uh, across institutional boundaries and deciding this is a, this is a, team, a team problem, not an individual problem has got to be part of the future we build. We've taken some baby steps and as impressive as they are and we're pleased with them it's not anywhere near what it needs to be. We need to standardize our practices. We truly need to build a culture of safety throughout our organization. Every patient, every time. Not negotiable. But the students are the hope for the future because I get to work with students all the time and they have a very different attitude about what their practice will be and how they're going to practice collectively, interprofessionally in the future. So that gives me hope to go on every day. Great doctors are not the ones that never make errors. Rather, they are people who expect errors to happen and who have strategies in place to cope with them.